Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Gray Zone. It's another momentous week. Uh, I heard a few newsworthy things happened over the weekend. So we're going to discuss that with award-winning Canadian journalist Aaron Mate. Welcome, Aaron. Hello, Max. Hey, everybody. Thanks for being here. Sorry for being late, but uh, if you're a regular follower of the Gray Zone, you probably come to expect that. <laughs> Only 10 minutes this time. It's not bad. And, yeah. Uh, so yeah. All my fault. Um, I didn't name any names. Uh, I, but uh, please like the stream, share the stream, help us beat algorithmic suppression. And yeah, thanks for being here. We might have a special guest uh, soon. And uh, we'll be announcing that if they arrive. Um, whether or not that happens, well, I think everybody watching this knows Iran retaliated for the brazen and unprecedented Israeli attack on its sovereign territory, an Israeli assault <clears throat> on April 1st that killed a top IRGC, two top IRGC officials, as well as several consular staff at the Iranian embassy in Damascus, as well as Syrian workers. And we've never seen anything like this. Um, even when the U.S. attacked China's embassy in in, uh, in Belgrade, which was probably intentional, it did apologize and issued several denials. But Israel, you know, it's not denying doing this. Iran had to do something, not only to save face for its domestic population, but to deter another Israeli attack. This attack came in light of the assassination of numerous Iranian nuclear scientists, Iranian officials. And there is no doubt that Netanyahu had a role in influencing Donald Trump's decision to kill Iranian Major General Qasem Soleimani, uh, which uh, also triggered an Iranian response. What we see, what we saw here with Iran is the sort of establishment of a new red line. Iran is saying, we're not going to outsource our retaliation to our allies in Lebanon or Yemen or anywhere else. We're going to do this directly, and we are going to strike Israeli territory if you attack us again. Uh, so it's sort of changed the rules of the game in the Middle East. Uh, this is one of Iran's targets. It's the um, Nevatim Israeli Air Base in the Negev Desert. Ya Allah! Hi, Wesleyan, Wesleyan. And you can see that the some of the missiles are striking. Um, so many ha are being intercepted by Israel air defenses, but you can see this is a second look at it. And some of that is shrapnel coming down. But additionally, we're seeing some missiles strike. Contrary to Israeli claims of a 99% interception rate, I don't know where they got that from. Uh, kind of reminds me of like Egyptian elections when they would announce 99% of people voted for Hosni Mubarak. Uh, Aaron, what were your thoughts when Iran responded? What are you and what are your, you know, what are your thoughts on the implications of what Iran has done? Well, first of all, the hypocrisy of the U.S. response was so stunning. There was all this talk about this was unprecedented. Iran had overreacted when, in fact, Iran didn't even kill anybody, as far as I know. One young girl was injured uh, in the in the Sinai, I believe, um, or in that area, uh, but there was no deaths. Compare that to Israel, which killed seven people when it hit this diplomatic compound. And Iran didn't hit a diplomatic compound. Uh, of Israel, they hit military sites, um, including that base that we just saw. But yet, the Western response was was as if Iran had committed some kind of aggression, and as if a state attacking another state in the Middle East was somehow unprecedented. When Israel attacks other states all the time, Israel's still sitting on the stolen land of Syria, the Golan Heights. It's still sitting on obviously the occupied West Bank and Gaza, um, and it's invaded Lebanon uh, at least twice. Uh, and launched attacks there several times. So 
none of this was unprecedented. I, I guess what was different is that for the first time, Iran struck back from its own territory directly, um, as you mentioned. And um, in terms of the military success, um, the fact that there was so much, the fact that everyone knew when Iran had launched these drones and had, you know, everyone was saying they're going to hit Israel in a couple of hours, that says to me that Iran was actually just trying to calibrate its response to show that it could strike back uh, and strike back harder next time. And the fact that these missiles pierced Israel's missile defense system, that strikes me as very significant. Even if it's true, the Israel said that 99% were intercepted, the fact that these missiles hit this uh, Israeli military base, only about, what, seven of them are launched, I believe, hypersonic missiles by Iran, a small number like that. So what happens yeah. if next time Iran launches a lot more? Uh, it's, it's just to me that Israel can't stop them. But And there were many indications that Iran was not looking to escalate. There was, This was in the Financial Times um, a few days before Iran's strike. Iran signals calibrated retaliation to Israeli strike. And what this article says, and uh, Alexander McCurris of the Duran has been talking about this a lot, that's why I first heard about it, uh, that uh, they were just trying to send a signal that they weren't going to let Israel carry out this act of aggression without a response, but they also didn't want to escalate this into a war. That was sent through intermediaries to the U.S. And so it looks like, to me, the message was was received. And Iran's uh, mission to the U.N., I believe, announced immediately after the first wave of ballistic missiles that it seeks that that it considers the matter closed for the time being um so it's very clear what iran was attempting to do their target was the neva team air base which is as i said in the negev desert the nakab which is not far from dimona the secret israeli nuclear facility this is an extremely heavily defended base and its target was the ramon air base also in the negev from where israel launched its attack on Syria. Um, so they're not targeting schools, kindergartens, embassies, doing what Israel does. Yeah. These were military targets. Uh, and Iran argued that its retaliation was in keeping with international law. Whether it was or not, it was certainly aimed at deterrence against fu future aggressive and brazen attacks, which have completely shredded the international order now um we we have a, a a guest waiting in the green room so let's bring in anya parampil to get her take on what we what we saw take place uh last weekend anya you've been saying that we are in world war three and this was sort of a a, a, like a historic chapter in the war that is currently that we're currently facing it's a political war first and foremost but explain what you mean and what your thoughts are on what we just witnessed there's always talk especially around israel now since october 7th of fears that world war three will begin i'm going to argue that we've been fighting world war three for several years we we are in a global war and it, it global war is defined when it results in an actual change in the power balance, the pre-existing world order. And that is now what we've entered. Th that stage in the war is what we have entered, probably even as a result of Putin's uh, action in Ukraine beginning in, in uh, 2022. Because if you look at the picture of, of the war that we now see in, in Gaza and then the other front in Ukraine, the allies, the coordination, the strategy is it's coordinated and the allies are the same. So Iranian drones, Iran has set, sold the drones that it used in this strike on Israel to Russia throughout the Russia-Ukraine conflict. And Russia has employed the stra same strategy of overwhelming Ukrainian air defense with drones in order uh, to act as a precursor to a larger strike. And now Iran, after testing these drones through that alliance, is escalating or responding really to years and years of provocations from Israel, but especially this red line, the strike on sovereign Iranian territory in uh, on the consular building in Syria, uh, in order to to demonstrate that the resistance axis, what the, what is often described as the resistance axis in the region, resisting U.S. hegemony in Israel in in the region. Uh, 
now has this capacity to fight back. And of course, if the U.S. were to get involved further, I think many people recognize that then you are talking about powers such as Russia stepping in as well. And I think because of previous world wars, we have this idea that it's not until the great powers themselves are fighting that we're in the world war. But in reality, since the end of the last world war, the United States and its allies have uh, worked to establish a global order, a financial order and military order uh, that over the last 10 years or so we can see is beginning to fall apart. Syria was, of course, a battlefield in which we saw the U.S. and its allies could not achieve their objective of regime change because Syria's alliance with Russia and other powers were too strong, or was too strong. And, and now I think it's up to us in the West to step back and try to figure out, especially as Americans, where we fit in this new world. Is it worth fighting for anymore? Is it possible now to instead talk about someone coming in to prevent World War III, begin discussing what a U.S. leader who could come in and look like to actually negotiate an end to it, negotiate peace in Europe, negotiate peace in the Middle East and say, we're done trying to bully, push the rest of the world through military force to participate in this dollar-based financial system that is already about to fall apart because of another prong in this war, which is the economic and financial war that Russia, China, and its allies have been preparing for and put in place also over a several-year strategy. And so we need to be level-headed here and recognize that, uh, yes, this could get worse before it gets better, but from the American side of things, I think if we miraculously got our got our country together and just operated like a normal country in this new world, we could actually have a reasonable place in it. Well, the Biden administration has declared its support for Israel to be ironclad, but that's obviously not the case. And Israel did not notify the Biden administration at any level of its planned attack, at least as far as we know, of its planned attack on the Iranian sovereign territory in Damascus. That's in contrast to Iran stating that it notified the U.S. in advance of its attack. As Aaron mentioned, there was a lot of time to process the coming attack. Uh, Iran warned of a calibrated response. Israel was able to prepare its air defenses for that attack. Um, I think if Iran had wanted to surprise Israel another October 7th, the damage would have been much greater. Iran didn't seek lots of civilian casualties. It wasn't targeting Tel Aviv with hypersonic missiles. I'm not even sure if any hypersonic missiles were fired. So the U.S., I mean, if you look at the U.S.'s ironclad ally, I mean, it's a psychotic state that is seeking, and Biden himself has leaked this, or the Biden people leaked this, right, Aaron, to NBC News, that they saw Netanyahu as trying to drag them into a wider war. So now you actually have Israel getting attacked in an unprecedented fashion. And without the U.S., obviously, they can't survive. And the U.S. is telling them, you shall not respond. So you even have the Biden administration doing, attempting some kind of stop back gap measure to prevent this from escalating into a regional war. <clears throat> I don't know what's, I mean, I, I have a sense of where things could go next and we can talk about the Israeli war cabinet and their deliberations. Uh, but I, I think this is unprecedented in seeing Israel be deterred in this way and even alienate its, uh, you know, its, its U.S. patron. Um, and here's what the U.S., you know, taxpayer had to dole out for Israel's deranged actions, a billion dollars, $1 billion, $200 million an hour during Iran's counterattack to defend the skies of apartheid Israel. I mean, those Iron Dome missiles are very expensive. Davidson. Happy tax day, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So happy tax day. Uh, get ready to um, pay Zelensky for his Miami condo and uh, Yair Netanyahu for his condo next door. You know, I, I hope you're right about uh, a wedge between Biden and Israel. But the problem is, you know, as you said, Israel's a lunatic state. 
uh, and Biden is so feckless that let's say Israel does launch some new escalatory attack on Iran, would Biden actually do anything to deter it? And yeah, they claim they didn't have advanced knowledge of the strike on Damascus. I think that's possible because Israel is so crazy that it makes sense to me that they, and they have such contempt for for Biden, um, and they see and they see him as someone that can be ignored. That I wouldn't be surprised that they launched that attack on on the Iranian uh, consulate without U.S. support. But I could just as easily see them doing it with U.S. support because so many Israeli strikes on Syria are joint U.S. Israeli strikes. You're muted. I know you're muted. One aspect of that strike on on that point that was really interesting to me when it happened was that my question was not only did the United States know that it took place, but who was actually calling the shots in Israel in that moment? Because if people recall, that strike happened on a Monday. Sunday night or Sunday afternoon, we were told that Netanyahu was hospitalized for a hernia surgery. I don't know where that came from or why. Uh, he had a hernia, how that happened. But it, it was this odd period where Netanyahu was apparently recovering from a, a an operation. And then suddenly this huge consequential strike is carried out in Damascus by the, by the Israeli military. To me, that, that was just very odd timing, especially because at least the way that I look at the Israeli state and, and the U.S. state at this point is that there are many moving factions, many different interests at play. And Netanyahu is in a fragile position in his own within his own state. And so did the U.S. know who, if in the U.S., was told knew? Because I feel, again, that there are moving parts and that we can't even speak of the U.S. government and the Israeli government as one or two separate but individual forces. Yeah. Um, Netanyahu is said to oppose immediate retaliation. Uh, interestingly, in his war cabinet, you have Gabi Ashkenazi, who's sort of to his left, emerges more from labor, former Israeli chief of staff who favored an immediate retaliation. Naftali Bennett to Netanyahu's right, who's not in the war cabinet, is called for an immediate retaliation. Benny Gantz, who's sort of supposed to be a centrist, but, you know, is no less fascist, has uh, opposes retaliation. The Passover holiday is coming up, and the Passover holiday is the beginning of crazy time in Israel. Uh, it's the beginning of this spring season of mass indoctrination uh, in which first Israelis learn that uh, you know, th th they observe the Passover holiday in a very exclusivist and you could even say genocidal way, uh, which is in contrast to the way that, you know, I observe it with my family or my community, uh, where they learn that in each generation or they're told in each generation, enemies have risen up to destroy us. And that's the Egyptians. Then, uh, oh, they already had Purim where, you know, the evil Persians try to destroy them. Then there's Memorial Day, where they observe all the soldiers who've been killed. They have Yom HaShoah, observing the Holocaust, where Israelis have to stop in the street with the sounding of a siren to commemorate the six million killed in the Holocaust. And, you know, you have to stop in the middle of the highway if that horn goes off. Everyone must stop and get out of their cars. And then you have Independence Day, when Israel supposedly won its independence through ethnic cleansing from Palestine. All this happens in a very compressed period. It contributes to the indoctrination of Jewish Israelis into a siege Masada mentality. And this is all happening now. So it doesn't make sense for Israel to invite a much stronger Iranian response during this period. Um, and it's so it's unclear to me what could happen next. But this this looks like Netanyahu's card just got pulled. He looks really weak. Um, he is unable to drag the U.S. in at this point. Maybe it could happen at a later date. But this just seems to be like a major political defeat, not just for Netanyahu, but for Israel. And we'll talk about this later as it's most of its troops have been pulled out of Gaza and people in Gaza are starting to return to the rubble of their homes. 
Um, I, I don't know how they're going to say, oh, we, you know, and, 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 and yet Biden is saying, telling Israel to accept its win. And the win is that, you know, nobody was killed. The air defenses generally worked. But that's this is not as the days go on through this holiday season in Israel, it's not going to look like a win. It's going to look like humiliation. But if uh, if Netanyahu is weakened, doesn't that make it more likely that he'll sort of uh, try to restore his uh, quote unquote uh, deterrence capacity, his hit his toughness by taking it out on the people of Gaza? So that would make it more likely that he will assault Rafa because, you know, that's that's like a he can always do that. He can always, you know, show his toughness to the Israeli society by just slaughtering more Palestinians who can't fight back. Well, I saw the attack on Iran as a way of a, a desperate means of um, closing daylight between him and the Biden administration. And it's the same Biden administration that has openly warned against Israel attacking Rafa. Um, so that there would it would create more daylight. It's obviously a domestic political liability for Biden to have Netanyahu uh, slaughtering on an industrial scale babies in Gaza because the ba Biden's base is completely cratering. This Gaza issue has become something that I think the Democratic consultant class never expected, like a real issue, not a boutique issue for the millennials and Gen Z who they you know count on to vote at some level. So I, 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 I don't know if that's the wisest response for Netanyahu, but he's uh, it, it's still possible and he's vowed a response in Rafa. The one thing that makes it more possible is the return of much of the refugee population to Khan Yunis, to the central areas around Darobala and even to the north, which is happening today. Um, but Anya, I wanted to ask you to you know keep putting this kind of in a, a wider perspective for us. Um, since the Iran deal, Iran has sort of been moving away from negotiations with the U.S., especially after the killing of Soleimani. I don't think the Iran considers the U.S. a honest broker, even if it can cut a deal with one administration, another one will cut in and come in and break the deal. It's joined BRICS. Um, it's joined the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So, you know, put this response in the context of sort of a shifting geopolitical reality. Well, people should recall that the Iran deal was controversial in Iran itself because there are elements within the Iranian government and Iranian society that saw it as a way for the West to actually weaken Iran and a weaken weaken Iran's position within this global chessboard that we now are seeing play out around Israel that Iran has known was always the war that they were preparing for for decades because... And this is what's so odd about the commentary that I've seen on U.S. media throughout the last two days. Also, I even saw it on Al Jazeera, uh, the Qatari state media trying to spin Iran's attack. Many of their commentators and anchors were trying to suggest that this was actually beneficial to Netanyahu because it took eyes off away from the war in Gaza and made uh, Israel look like a victim. Well, that is, to me, just an asinine way of viewing this conflict because you can't separate what is happening from in Iran and in Syria from what is happening in Gaza. This is all one war. So to look at Gaza as a vacuum is really to live in a fantasy land. This war is part of a war that Israel has been fighting since its founding to establish what it views as greater Israel in the region. The war in Syria was absolutely part of that, as Aaron mentioned, securing the Golan Heights. They didn't get regime change in Syria, but securing Golan Heights for Israel was an important consolidation in, in that overall plan that Israel has. And they've, you know, the Yom Kippur War, all of these wars were all about gaining the territory that Israel has mapped out uh, as its as its rightful land. And so the strike that occurred in Damascus when Iran and when Israel hit this Iranian consulate was a strike in this war because they were targeting the commanding general of the Al-Quds force, the Iranian, uh, the uh, element within the Iranian military that actually strategizes with Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, 
all of what we always constantly hear are the Iranian proxies in the area, in the region that are attacking Israel right now, the only ones willing to deliver Israel a bloody nose as it carries out this genocide in Gaza. And so that was a, a direct strike a way to lure Iran into direct confrontation with Israel, but also take out not only this commanding general, but uh, his his advisors and other prominent figures that are coordinating this war and fighting Israel on a daily basis in a way that people, I think, in the West cannot really comprehend. And so we cannot separate what Iran did in Israel from the war in Gaza. Of course, like Aaron said, that's just where Netanyahu can turn up the heat in order to prove his bloodlust and his toughness, because now Iran really has demonstrated that if, and just like on over October 7th, when we saw the paper tiger of the Israeli national security state is weak or perhaps devious, uh, I don't know, hopefully we'll get answers onto what actually happened around the intelligence failures there years from now. But we also now have seen the paper tiger of the Iron Dome system. The Iron Dome, there's that video of Trump talking about how it goes like pew, 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 and you have 17 seconds to hit anything that comes into Israel's airspace. It's it's supposed to be this amazing piece of technology, but it's only an amazing piece of technology because of all of the U.S. taxpayer money that we pump into it. Now it's possibly depleted. And so we're going to have to vote and push more money, billions of dollars into Israel's little system again. But the reality is the Iranians can keep depleting it if they would like to. And if Israel would like to keep this war uh, escalating this war. And the reality is so many Israelis have already fled, left Israel, even before this Iranian strike because of the attacks from Hezbollah and Hamas, that, and they don't ever plan on going back. Israel's economy is already suffering to a degree that I think a few years from now, we will see this war had already defeated Israel, perhaps even before the Iranians retaliated. Israel is weaker than ever. You know, I just want to say one thing about Syria. It's nothing new to anybody who watches the gray zone, but it's still not, I think, understood in, in like the left media that, that we're a part of. That it, it, I just hope people can see now with Iran firing back at Israel, Hezbollah also doing damage to Israel. And Hezbollah actually holding back, um, not doing as much damage as it could be, uh, because Israel's been actually avoiding trying to fight Hezbollah directly because because Hezbollah can fight back. The people can see why the Syria dirty war happened. It's so obvious. They wanted to actually draw in Iran and Hezbollah to bleed them there because they didn't want to fight them directly. And they wanted to use uh, the CIA proxies and the uh, uh, insurgents to, to do it for them. Um, and it's still not understood. Uh, but it, it's so obvious why. And the you know the importance of these countries and being able to resist and deter Israeli U.S. hegemony, it's underscored right now because they're the only ones who are fighting back. So no wonder the U.S. and Israel and their allies invested so much money in a proxy war in Syria trying to bleed them. Yeah, and to destroy the Palestine solidarity, solidarity movement in the United States and splinter it along these lines, you either had people that supported the war on Syria and were completely disconnected from the bigger picture and the the centrality of the Syrian state to Palestinian resistance and and just completely actually throwing Palestinians under the bus at that point or you had people who were too afraid to discuss Syria and take it on because they thought that it would spoil Palestine but i mean how ridiculous is that now looking at this world that we're living in it's clear you cannot again remove palestine from everyone else in the region and uh it's very telling because all of the the turk the turkish government the qatari government the saudi government all of the muslim states in the region that were pummeling syria and doing everything they could to destroy it uh have not really been there for the palestinians throughout these last several months and in fact the turks are supplying israel's fuel and selling Israel weapons. That's Erdogan, the great wannabe leader of the new Turkish empire and like revamped Muslim Brotherhood. So what does that really say about those groups and those organizations if if, if when it push comes to shove, when this genocide mm -hmm. and destruction of Palestine is happening before our eyes, that that's where the Muslim leaders all end up? Yeah, well, look see, at yeah, yeah, go ahead. Well, just quickly, Jordan, right? Like Jordan goes from hosting the CIA, uh, uh, base that was used to coordinate 
the Syrian insurgency's operations, including its takeover of the province of Idlib, the last so-called rebel-controlled province of Syria. So Jordan hosts that. It also hosts some U.S. military base. That's where those three American soldiers were killed recently in that drone attack. Uh, and now what happened just this past weekend? Jordan is helping Israel shoot down Iranian drones and missiles. Yeah. In, and a, I country, mean, in a country where, you know, is it, is it the majority of the population are Palestinian refugees or at least a, a huge amount of people are Palestinian refugees, but their leadership is a straight up collaborator with Israel and the U.S. and assisting uh, Israel in 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 <laughs> deterring the one country that's that's resisting Israel. The dirty little secret about Jordan is that for all of their talk of being an ancient Hashemite empire, like with to bloodlines ties to this ancient kingdom, the king of Jordan is half British. And if that were the case, if if, if they were really this ancient uh, 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 royal family, you, yeah, you wouldn't have a blue eyed British man running uh, the, the <laughs> kingdom of Jordan. You would have someone who looked more like this other tribal leader in the picture. And 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 it's important that the extra, the like cherry on top of that dirty secret is that Jordan is an invented kingdom. It's Palestine, okay? Like it, it should be from the river to past the river all the way to all of Jordan to the sea is Palestine. The British are the ones that just drew these little maps and said, okay, we're going to put a little invented kingdom here to act as a buffer zone between our little state where we're going to export a bunch of European refugees and make Israel. Then they put this little kingdom on the side to, to kind of act as a buffer between the rest of the region. And now we see ultimately the king of Jordan simply exists to protect Israel. That's it. And it's because he answers to NATO and the British and his masters. He doesn't answer to some proud Jordanian people. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the Hashemite monarchy, as you said, it, 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 it's, it's installed by the British after the Hashemites were kicked out of Iraq. Uh, Sykes-Picot in the great game divided up the Middle East, invented this little country, Transjordan, and during the Nakba, the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, which is referred to in Israel as the War of Independence, King Abdullah I was hosting a female emissary from the Zionist movement who was working directly under David Ben-Gurion, um, who was, going to, was to be the first prime minister of Israel. And her name was Golda Meir. Golda Meyerson from uh, Milwaukee, who was uh, sent in Arab garb undercover to conduct these secret negotiations with King Abdullah, where they would divide up and annex Palestine after conducting a phony war in which the Royal Jordanian Army, which had been trained by Pasha Glub by the British, uh, would fight all the way up to the Latrun Gap, but stop there so as not to destroy the Zionist army, the Haganah, and they would grant Israel the rest of Palestine. Uh, the rest of what, what took place within there wasn't really all these Arab armies teaming up on this puny little David foe. It was the Arab Liberation Armies armed with old M1 carbines that barely worked. Those were the Palestinian indigenous resistance forces, some Muslim Brotherhood volunteers from Egypt, and pretty much nothing else. Um, the 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 Mats Pen movement in Israel, the first anti-Zionist group of Jewish Israelis, exposed all of this. And then Avi Schleim took it to the next level and wrote a book about it for those who are interested. But basically, the Jordanian monarchy sold out the Palestinians in such a catastrophic way that in 1951, a Palestinian actually assassinated Abdullah I. Then you have the next monarch, uh, King Hussein, sells off, sells, sells out again normalizes with Israel under the watch of President Bill Clinton and gains nothing, gains nothing. And now we have his son, or we have uh, Abdullah II, well, sorry. Uh, yeah. And on that point, like Netanyahu and Bashar al-Assad, perhaps you could say, what am I mistaken that there was another son that not born from the British wife that was meant to inherit the crown from King Abdullah's father? Or is am I making that up? Um, I believe, yeah, I believe that, <laughs> I believe that's the case. Um, 
it, but it, it was it was um, i'm gonna i'm gonna get uh hazy but i'm hazy pretty sure hazy on the situation that it's there. like a, it's a it's a, it's one of those common storylines where there was another son another brother who was meant to inherit the throne but well, I mean, you go to Jordan, you go to Jordan now, you're going to, I mean, you're going to see pictures of this teenager. I guess maybe he's in his twenties now. The last time I was there as a teenager, they're just pictures of an adolescent boy everywhere. It's like a lost boy on a milk carton, except he's wearing a military uniform. That is Abdullah's son who they're preparing to take over again. And he's basically being prepared in all the academies in England for this role. So that's what you have there is basically a human warehouse for Palestinian refugees. Um, and, uh, you know, the rewards just keep coming in for the king, the king, you know, who assisted Israel in blocking Iranian ballistic missiles, hosts U.S. air bases, hosted U.S., you know, secret bases for the dirty war on Syria, Israel to extend water agreement with Jordan. Jordan actively helped thwart the Iranian threat against Israel. And now it appears Israel is prepared to thank the Hashemite kingdom by granting a year's extension despite previous reluctance. Israel doesn't have any water. It's basically screwed over Jordan by usurping the water from the Jordan River and then, you know, and the West Bank. In, and the West Bank. Yeah. There's aquifers there. I'm so, sure that's part of it. Yeah. Yeah. And so, it, I mean, wow, they're going to give them water for another year. That's crumbs off the master's table. And that's what, that's the kind of a uh, dignity that the King has brought to the Arab world. I mean, and it's never been, it's ex been exposed like never before. I mean, what we've been seeing, oh, go ahead on you. I know. I just remembered that there was that bizarre coup attempt too in Jordan in 2021. And since then, uh, King Abdullah's half brother has actually been under house arrest in Jordan. So this is a very dictatorial, obviously. I mean, they're not pretending to be a democracy kingdom, but there are definitely there's something there. There are deeper family issues here at play because I am sure there are elements within the Jordanian establishment that do not want to support Israel and the West to this degree. Uh, do you remember that a few? It was in 2021, I think. Uh, and yeah, since then, Prince Hamza, who was who was the crown prince, he was uh, in 1999 was named the crown prince, is now under house arrest. So there's a lot of intrigue in Jordan, and I don't think we get a lot of reporting about it because it's such a controlled and tightly managed uh, society. You know, all that we hear about Syria or even Iraq, I think, at certain points, uh, have nothing on the Jordanian intelligence services. So, Max, maybe you can speak more about that. Well, Jordan's court says, so basically Prince Hamza apologized for last year's alleged plot to destabilize the pro-Western kingdom. Um, you have to wonder then what his interest is. We never, we, we just never hear about it. It's sort of papered over. Whereas, you know, any possible threat to the Assad family's control over Syria would be front page news. Yeah, I mean, imagine if Assad had a half brother who tried to lead a revolution, they would say it wouldn't be a coup and he was under house arrest. It would be a huge story. <laughs> well, Prince Hamza basically accused the rulers of Jordan of being feckless, corrupt, completely hapless uh, in a video message. And it, you know, it did go viral. And that was the end of him. Um, and, you know, King Abdullah, he's been papering over his relationship, direct relationship with Israel and the West through these photo ops where he's dropping aid over Gaza. It's kind of like when he participated in the mission in a US made F-15 against ISIS after ISIS captured and tortured to death a Jordanian pilot. I mean, he's the master of photo ops. Here he is basically, by the way, allowing um, Israel to not permit aid by land to create the perception that aid is going in by air that people are getting enough this is basically just hospara <laughs> yeah this is like well i have to and it's also 
it's also killed people, right? People have been killed by these airdrops. I don't know if they came from Jordan or not, but there was even more deaths uh, just the other day in Gaza. I wonder what the death toll is now from uh, just alone, these airdrops killing people because they drop on their heads. Uh, yeah, I, well, I have to jump off, but uh, I, I wanted to say that you should play King Abdullah on Star Trek before I go. <laughs> Well, the, yeah, that's basically what he is. He's just an actor and a tool. Mm. And then they put him out there to do the things like he just did, <laughs> dropping aid for Palestinians. And then there's a, a boy who Israel. just died of an airdrop. An airdrop apparently killed this child. And uh, he was the subject of a GoFundMe campaign to try to raise money to get him out of Gaza um, through the corrupt and feckless Egyptian regime. Um, but we've seen, you know, airdrops kill five in one shot. Whoever thought that was a good idea. Anyway, Anya, thanks. And thanks a lot, Anya Parmpil for dropping in. And, um, and yeah, we, we, um, we've been covering the Iranian response to Israel's attack on the Iranian consulate and uh there there's a, there's a, there's a you know it exposes some interesting dimensions here in washington and in the west because it was the uk and the us that essentially endorsed what israel did in its brazen and unprecedented attack in violating international law and now they're all demanding that international law be followed in condemning Iran. Here's David Cameron, the foreign minister of the UK. Iran to have done. And I think the whole world can see all these countries that have somehow wondered, well, you know, what is the true nature of Iran? It's there in black and white. What would Britain do if a hostile nation flattened one of our consulates? Well, we would take, uh, we, you know, we would take the very strong action. <laughs> what they did, as I said, was a so massive attack. So they were right think, to respond, but they overreacted, is well, what you're I, saying? I'm, what I'm saying they is that the, right atta the, attack, the attack they carried out was on a very large scale, much bigger than but people they accepted. they have a right to respond? Well, countries have a right to respond when they feel they've suffered uh, an aggression. Of course they do. But look at the scale of that response. Had those weapons not so been shot right down, respond, but they there, just could have been, there could have been thousands of casualties, including civilian casualties. I think that's a really important point. So um, not not bad from the interviewer at Sky News. Uh, David Cameron really has nothing to say there. I mean, it was obvious that Iran wasn't attempting to cause massive casualties, that they were targeting military targets. It was obvious. Uh, but now what Iran has done is disproportionate. Has he ever said that about Israel slaughtering 33,000 people in the Gaza Strip, two, -third of them, two thirds of them women and children? We just never hear that. Yeah, and again, he says, uh, if Iran's uh, missiles, uh, if all the drones and missiles had hit, then thousands would have been killed. Well, as you just point out, Israel has killed tens of thousands of people. No condemnation. And again, Iran gave plenty of advance warning that these attacks were coming, which allowed Israel to shoot everything down, with the exception of those missiles that struck military targets and didn't even kill anybody, didn't, didn't even kill armed forces, uh, just did a little bit of damage to these military bases. And he still has the gall to complain about it. Yeah. And by the way, it's so uh, yeah. We, 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 sorry, ahead. just one more point. Iran said, by the way, that had the UN Security Council condemned Israel, then these attacks might not have even been necessary. But the problem there is the US, Britain, and France uh, blocked any kind of UN measure condemning Israel for striking the Iranian consulate. So Iran felt that it was compelled to act. But imagine if they hadn't have done that. Imagine if. Britain hadn't joined with the U.S. and France to stand in the way of just a U.N. Security Council measure condemning an act of aggression against a diplomatic facility, maybe Iran wouldn't even have responded, at least according to Iran. Yeah, I mean, that was their argument at the United Nations, that you know the U.S., France, and Britain prevented a Security Council condemnation of Israel. It was pretty clear also Iran had approached the Americans and said, look, if you can use the, the massive leverage you have over Israel to impose a ceasefire, we're not going to respond. That would be enough for us. But they weren't going to do that. So this is what you get. And what they got was 
minimal. I mean, it's been being reported and I'm seeing it in Israeli and Iranian media that Iran is preparing 1500 ballistic missiles for a three day long counterattack on Israel if Israel responds and strikes Iranian territory again. So it's pretty obvious Iran could do a lot more. Uh, th I mean, the, the biggest irony here was Gilad Erdan, this psychotic Israeli UN ambassador, you could call him kind of a, an anti-UN ambassador. His entire shtick has just been to condemn the UN and accuse them of genocide. He's been showing up wearing a yellow Star of David like those Jews were forced to wear inside Germany after the passage of the Nuremberg Laws, claiming playing playing up to his victimhood persecution complex at the UN. And now he has demanded an emergency UN session on Iran's response after receiving so much diplomatic cover from Israel's neo-colonial patrons. And it was a completely crazy display at the UN yesterday. Uh, characteristic, though, by Gilad Ardan. Here's, here's one of my favorite parts. This night... Iran proved again that it cares nothing, nothing for Islam or Muslims. The Iranian attack seriously injured Amina El Khassouni, a seven-year-old Bedouin girl in Israel. But look at this video that shows how Israel intercepts Iranian drones above the Temple Mount and Al-Aqsa Mosque. Here you can look at it. Here you can look at it. He's 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 saying that to the Iranian ambassador. Like a to like Iran, a, Israel's yeah, annihilation um, and igniting the region is more important than Islamic holy sites. The Ayatollah regime, in its plot to impose a global Shiite hegemony through its proxies, has even attacked Saudi Arabia, as we all remember, Aramco oil field, the United Arab Emirates. And anyone, anyone else they view as an obstacle. <laughs> so basically, I mean, it, it's a time-tested tactic of trying to split the Muslim world and split Iran and the Arabs, split Sunni and Shia. Fragmentation is at the heart of uh, the Zionist strategy in the region. But it's so absurd. Uh, and I was seeing this all over the Hasbara accounts across Twitter. Basically, they got images of the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem with some missiles overhead, which were very, very far away. They weren't targeting yeah. the mosque. Just because there are like missiles that you can see doesn't mean it's targeting you. It's like, you know, when I get a police helicopter flying nearby in my neighborhood, it doesn't mean they're looking for me. Mm -hmm. And this, and this, But this proves that Israel is the true protector of Al-Aqsa and global Islam. And Israel cares about the lives of Arabs. Arab lives matter because a 10-year-old got wounded by shrapnel. It was actually shrapnel from the Iron Dome, not a ballistic missile. Hmm. This is like a lot of what we see in Ukraine. Hmm. That was initially reported by CNN. And so suddenly Israel's protecting Palestinians and protecting Bedouins. And they care about Arabs and they care about Islam. I mean, it's the phoniest Hasbara ploy. I, I, one of the phoniest I've seen since 2021 when Gilad Erdan said the same thing when Hamas fired rockets toward Jerusalem, which are less uh, have less targeting capacity than Iran's ballistic missiles, and he said he showed some lights over the Al Aqsa compound from those rockets and said we're protecting Al Aqsa. Who's in Israel's government right now? The security minister Itamar Ben Gvir. This is the guy who leads the invasions of the Al Aqsa compound and is part of the Temple Movement that is determined to blow it up to build the fourth Jewish Temple. And yeah. Gilad Erdan is part of that government. How did the second intifada begin? Uh, a major provocation was when Ariel Sharon deliberately went to the Al-Aqsa compound, right? Trying to spark uh, a Palestinian uprising, um, which would give Israel an excuse to uh, stop uh, pretending to offer Palestinians a state with, with the peace process that was going on at, at the time. Um, that was, I believe, one of our Sharon's goals, if, if I remember that right. And also, meanwhile, in real life, it also what also was happening in those videos from Al-Aqsa and other parts of the Palestinian territories, Palestinians were cheering at the sight of Israel getting a taste of its own medicine. For once, somebody actually resisting Israel uh, and striking its military 
site. So yeah, um, what a typical performance from that Israeli diplomat. Well, here's a here's Israel protecting the Al-Aqsa compound back in I think 2021, <laughs> eating the hell out of worshippers. <laughs> This is Israel defending Islam. This actually led to an es military escalation with the factions in the Gaza Strip. Firing flashbangs, tear gas. So yeah. I mean, this is an Israeli government that has at least two members in ministerial positions who want to blow Al-Aqsa up. And that was Israel's argument before the world. And it's so sad that the UN actually has to stop and listen to this and hold an emergency session from a country that really is determined to blow up the UN. It's certainly blowing up the whole UN system. Yeah. And you know, um, Israel's attack there on Al-Aqsa on Al in 2021, it shows why Israel hates Gaza and Hamas so much is because that's a good example. So when Israel was doing that, um, you know, attacking the worshipers in Al-Aqsa, the Palestinian Authority, which, you know, Israel props up in the West Bank, did nothing, you know, because they're a collaborator. Meanwhile, Hamas, despite being totally cut off from uh, Jerusalem and the West Bank, they took it upon themselves to defend Al-Aqsa and knowing, even knowing that Israel would, you know, take out their fury on Gaza, they fired rockets to try to deter Israel from its attack on Al-Aqsa Mosque. And, and whatever you think of that decision, that was Gaza resisting. That was Hamas resisting Israeli aggression, which shows why now Israel is so driven to destroy Gaza because they can't tolerate any act of resistance against their aggression. Yeah, it's that. It's um, Israel seizing homes in uh, Sheikh Jarrah in East Jerusalem and the Palestinians there are defenseless. So the factions in the Gaza Strip who are still able to deter Israel to some capacity, took it upon themselves to make, to send a response. And they said, and then they'll, they'll say, we'll stop firing rockets when you stop stealing their homes, when you stop these incursions into Al-Aqsa. October 7th was called Al-Aqsa Flood. It's about that. Um, so nobody accepts this reasoning anymore. And you only will see it from Hasbara accounts that are essentially programmed from Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. And we're even now seeing revelations that Canadian students are being paid to pump out Hasbara on behalf of Israel. Um, Jake Tapper and Wolf Blitzer, I don't, I mean, they're being paid by CNN, but they're, they're effectively agents of Israel at this point. If you watch them at such a dangerous and perilous moment, when the majority of Americans do not want to become embroiled in this war, Wolf Blitzer is brought on, do, called up for duty on the weekend to lead CNN's coverage and host one APAC stooge after another, like Representative Mike Lawler to call for a direct U.S. response to Iran and no voices to the contrary. That's Wolf Blitzer, former researcher at APAC, and also Jake Tapper, who's just been one of the biggest media Jewish supremacists, like just a complete supremacist, just waving his Zionism uh, wearing it on his sleeve since, Octo since October 7th, clamoring for Israel to bombard the Gaza Strip, and now giving space to a literal CIA asset in um, Masay Alinejad, uh, also a complete fabulist, but a, co a total stooge of the U.S. national security state, to call for a direct war between the U.S. and Iran. Uh, and Jake, I mean, Jake Tapper, again, hosting no one to the contrary. He tries to play it straight. He tries to look like a newsman, but we know what he's up to. The Islamic Republic is directly involved. Yes, I strongly condemn the attacks uh, alongside millions of Iranians. Uh, the opposition. It's hard to interrupt, but look who's coming up right after her. Pre Israeli President Isaac Herzog, who said there are no uninvolved civilians in Gaza. From Syria, from Iraq, Iran, they condemn that. But we believe that should be a, a tipping point for democratic countries to use this opportunity to have a united uh, alliance against the Islamic Republic. Because look, people of Iran don't want war, but the Islamic Republic wants to bring stability in the region 
for them doesn't matter if it's bringing war in the region. And that's why we believe that a lack of action will embolden the Islamic Republic um, to actually come back more and stronger. So you think that Israel should respond uh, militarily and strongly by, by what, striking military targets within Iran? You know, it's not on me. It's on the Israeli government to make decision. But of course, I don't want my people to be hurt. But targeted military action against uh, the high-ranking member of Revolutionary Guards actually made a lot of Iranian people to celebrate the killings of uh, the commanders. There it is. Attack my country. Yeah, meanwhile, when uh, the U.S. assassinated Qasem Soleimani, I mean, everyone saw the footage. Those massive crowds in Iran came out to mourn him, um, not celebrate his murder. But that's who gets put on CNN, is someone who will lie through their teeth to advocate uh, more aggression. Uh, <laughs> Jake Tapper's question. Jake, Jake wants strikes on Iran. I mean, that's what he's obviously clamoring for. I mean, she she supports she supports sanctions. She supports anything to destroy Iran. And yet she claims to be a voice of Iran. Uh, she has been paid through Voice of America by Voice of America, which is a spinoff or a cutout of the CIA. It was founded through the CIA during the high point of the Cold War. And her salary has come through Voice of America and through USAID. She's been granted meetings with Mike Pompeo, other U.S. officials. She's constantly meeting with the State Department. She is effectively a U.S. intelligence asset who is there to say what neoconservatives and Israeli officials say from behind in an Iranian face with a perpetual bad hair day. And, uh, you know, if I'm talking about somebody's hair, that it must be pretty, pretty uh, messed up. And didn't they invent, invent some fake kidnapping plot involving her where they said that Iran was plotting to kidnap her onto a boat from the U.S. and take her to Venezuela? Yeah, the, the Venezuelans, uh, Venezuelan military was going to take her on fast boats from her after she was transported by Israeli agents from her home in Brooklyn. And they were going to take her back to Venezuela, where she was then going to be basically held for ransom. And that was a federal criminal case brought against um, several Shia people in the U.S. who were prosecuted under this unusual plot by the FBI. Uh, which also increased her fame within U.S. neoconservative circles. So this yeah. is a joke. I mean, it's a joke. Look at the Iranians that they're bringing on. Uh, Arash Azizi, this complete pseudo-Marxist clown who's got this piece in The Atlantic about how the Iranian people you know, don't stand with Iran's response. He really speaks for the Iranian people, except he worked for Iran International, which is Mohammed bin Salman's propaganda channel for pumping Saudi Israeli propaganda into Iran. Pretty sure he worked for VOA too. Um, he signed this letter like uh, with other fake kind of Trotskyist Marxists uh, de denouncing people for uh, being too mean to Israel after October 7th. I mean, if you're, if you're writing in the Atlantic, which is edited by Jeffrey Goldberg, a former Israeli prison guard, you're not speaking for Iranians. Sorry. Uh, they would never let someone who speaks for Iranians do that. But uh, Iranians are going to continue to, Iranian people will continue to be targeted and killed until Israel is deterred. That's just the reality. Uh, and, and most Iranians do not want to go back to the days of the Shah, whatever criticisms uh, and condemnations they have of their government. Jake Tapper will never give voice to those Iranians. Jake Tapper will also never apologize for laundering the Israeli-U.S. lies about a, a Hamas command and control node under Al-Shifa Hospital. Uh, he printed that. That's been shown to be yet another lie. The result was recently Al-Shifa being largely destroyed. Hundreds of people, or a lot of people massacred there. They're still uncovering people in, in mass graves. And where's the accountability for that? There's not, actually not even really attention on that. Everyone's sort of forgotten about Israel's destruction of Gaza's largest hospital because there's been so many other uh, crimes and atrocities, including the killing of the world central kitchen workers and the attack on the consulate in Damascus. But Al Shifa, 
destruction of a hospital along with so many others. It's no discussion of it really, or almost no discussion of it, almost no discussion of it in US media. And by the way, I, I'm, I'm sorry to be a little bit of a hater, but just, I, I have to show this, this is funny. You mentioned that guy, what's his name, Arash? Um, yeah. Uh, he, he, was recently, he was recently featured in this Intercept story. He was interviewed, Iran and US wage a shadow war behind Gaza conflict. Uh, and this is an interview with 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 him on, on the intercept. So, um, funnily enough, <laughs> funnily enough, this so this idea of like these two equal parties, Iran and Israel, you know, using Gaza and other areas to fight a shadow war. You know, funnily enough, a really concise uh, debunking of this was put out recently by Paul Pilar, who is a former, he's a longtime CIA veteran, and he said this. Despite frequent references in symmetrical terms to a shadow war between Iran and Israel, a compilation of events in that war shows an asymmetrical pattern of Israel initiating most of the violence and Iran mostly responding, which is exactly right. Uh, so this idea, and it's very popular now, um, this idea of a shadow war between Iran and Israel and ever, you know, Iran using this network of proxies that it controls, it's just complete propaganda. Um, it's actually Iran responding to the main aggressor in the region, which is Israel and its U.S. ally. Well, and that was the Chiron when Masih Alinejad came on Jake Tapper. It was a shadow war. Shadow war, yeah. But then she's saying it's no longer a shadow war, so uh, you know Israel has the right to respond, cheering on Israel, kill Iranian officials. She's saying from U.S. territory, where the U.S. government pays her salary. Um, you know, I've, I've been reading. Uh, about how Biden is really getting hammered. He's he's being, what is it? I forget what the word Axios used was. I don't have the headline in front of me, but he's like he's bombarded by Democrats with criticism for his failure to attack Iran. Then you read inside the article and it's one cyborg who's attacking him, uh, who was hospitalized for a long period and then came out and his brain had been apparently replaced by APAC. And it's basically just like a chip, which, you know, is re reading Hasbara talking points transmitted by the AI Hasbara Tron from Tel Aviv. Uh, and he walks around dressed in an outfit that would get black men tackled and brutally tased by cops if they walked into a convenience store. But uh, his name is John Fetterman. And he's also getting a great platform from Jake Tapper to spout neoconservative propaganda that even a lot of Republicans are ashamed to to say. Iran's attack on Israel, and how worried are you that this is the beginning of an open war between the two countries? Well, it, a couple of things actually. I think it really demonstrates how it's astonishing that we are not uh, standing firmly with Israel and there should never be any kinds of conditions on all of that. When a nation can launch hundreds of drones uh, towards Israel, and I'm not going to be talking about conditions ever. And second, I, I think that also was Iran had to have some fireworks after Israel uh, smoked that Iranian uh, general. And, and I, I'm here for that. <laughs> uh, I'm here for that. It's just a matter of theater after Israel uh, smoked that Iranian uh, general, and and I, I'm here for that. <laughs> uh, and I think it's just a matter of theater part of it as well, too. And it, finally, it demonstrates how unstable things are and why we need to lean in and stand with Israel. How do you think Israel should respond? Should Israel strike within Iranian territory, or are you concerned that that might only escalate matters further? Well, I'm, I'm not going to uh, suggest it, what Israel should or shouldn't do on that. But I also do think that Iran is pleased with, they have enough of money on the table with all of its proxies all around in the region as well, too. And Iran certainly can't take on Israel, uh, and certainly not us. So I think they would just like to keep things as they go. And then after they made a point uh, back, I, I think they could go pretty quiet and go back to just using their proxies. A senior administration official tells CNN that, that President Biden told Prime Minister Netanyahu that the U.S. will not participate in any offensive operations against Iran. Do you think that's the right call uh, or should direct U.S. military action, as some of your colleagues in the Senate are suggesting, 
Uh, should that be on the table? I, I don't agree with that, you know, and uh, I'm just, uh, I'm just think we should follow and have Israel's back in the situation. I don't agree with the president. Uh, that doesn't change anything that he's a fantastic uh, president. So yeah, there's John Fetterman. He's kind of got, he's got some worn brick, weathered brick background. He's over there in Braddock, PA. He's a man of the working class spouting APAC talking points about the need to Get all of the boys in Braddock uh, who are enlisted over there to fight and die for a psychotic little apartheid state 5,000 miles away. Uh, this is a guy who ran as a progressive. And he sounds like he's 12 years old. You know, we, yeah. we says when Israel smoked that general and he gives, I'm there yeah. for that. He gives the thumb up. Here for that. That's not here for that. Like, But this is the high level analysis that Jake Tapper uh has to rely on because who will defend Israel that forcefully anymore? Uh, it's uh, it's 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 a limited pool of people, at least in the Democrat. One part. Democrat who will do it, so he gets <laughs> to go on Tapper. Like there's there's no other Democratic senator who would have done that. Yeah. Uh, go against Biden during an election year. Uh, the only other, and he really like one of the main Democratic members of Congress doing it is Sheila Jackson Lee. You know, Iran is a terrorist nation. They have just launched a disproportionate terrorist attack against our ally Israel. We must stand against this terrorist nation, blah, blah, blah. She's a, you know, relatively liberal member of Congress from Texas, who's part of the Black Congressional Caucus. She's also an asset of the Iranian MEK terrorist cult. And here she is with Mariam Rajavi, the exiled cult leader who calls for regime change and wages terrorist attacks and assassinations across Iran. So, um, you know, Brad Sherman is also an MEK tool and a lot of people uh, within Congress are currently subjects of MEK influence. And this is allowed in our political system. So that's th those are the, the Democrats who are for this assault, for, for an assault on Iran. Um, but for the most part, there, there just isn't really much of a constituency domestically for the U.S. getting involved in doing Israel's dirty work. Yeah. Well, somebody who's feeling left out of all this is this guy right here, Vladimir Zelensky. And he put out a statement basically begging <laughs> for equal treatment that, you know, uh, why can't he be given the same protection that Israel gets as a U.S. proxy? given that Ukraine is a U.S. proxy as well. And he said, and he praised the response to Iran. He said, the entire world witnessed allied action in the skies above Israel neighboring countries. It demonstrated how truly effective unity in defending against terror can be when it's based on sufficient political will. Uh, Israel, the U.S., U.K., France, Jordan acted together with maximum efficiency. Together, they prevented terror from prevailing. So he's ass-kissing his paymasters. Uh, and then he goes on, Israel is not a NATO member, so no action such as triggering Article 5 was required, and no one was dragged into the war. They simply contributed to the protection of human life. European <laughs> skies could have received the same level of protection long ago if Ukraine had received similar full support from its partners in intercepting drones and missiles. Terror must be defeated completely and everywhere, not more in some places and less in others. What he doesn't understand is that he doesn't understand his role. Uh, his role is not to, in the eyes of the U.S., to defend his country. It's to be used to bleed Russia. So the U.S. doesn't care about giving Ukraine the missile defenses it needs to you know, uh, defend itself against Russian attacks. It just cares about giving Ukraine whatever equipment can prolong the war and bleed Russia. That's the goal. But Austin said it. Our goal is to weaken Russia. Jake, Al Jake Sullivan said our goal is to hand Russia a strategic defeat so that it's so that elements of its national power are weakened. So Zelensky still doesn't understand what his role is here. Um, and he still thinks, he still has it in his head that somehow he's somehow uh, an equal partner of, of Washington, uh, when really he's just a tool to achieve the goal of bleeding, of, of bleeding Russia. And Israel plays a different role. Israel is a much more longstanding ally of the U.S. It's been a client state for a lot longer. So Ukraine has to wait its turn. It's only been a client state for 10 years. 
Israel's been a client state that, dating back to 1967. So therefore, it receives far more benefits. Yeah, I think uh, the podcast Russians with Attitude put it best. Uh, this is really a case of the prostitute complaining about a husband giving his wife some flowers. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you need to get a better lobby to Zelensky. <laughs> the, the Atlantic Council just ain't cutting it or whatever, yeah. whatever it is you got. Some OUNB guys in in like Minnesota or something. It's not, it's not anywhere near APAC and the amount of muscle they bring to bear. Um, I wanted to recognize someone, uh, who's, who's transitioning, uh, to a new, um, position who's contributed a lot since October 7th. Um, that's, uh, Elon Levy who is, uh, now, <laughs> At the Israeli civilian spokesperson's office, uh, it looks like he was fired or demoted from his job as the prime minister spokesman. Um, this was after he, I think, chewed out David Cameron on Twitter. Not a good look for this uh, Oxford graduate. He's looking pretty indigenous there, isn't he? Um, so now he's delivering press conferences from a sort of fake office that they created for him. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of major changes since October 7th. Here's Elon. Uh, Hi bookers, former Israeli government spokesman available for interviews. DMS are open. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's pretty sad. Um, should we invite him on? Uh, sure. But, I really doubt he would go on with anybody who is actually knowledgeable or somewhat knowledgeable of the of his country's uh, history. Um, this is what Felix Biederman of Chapo Trapo said about this. He said he's doing the spokesman equivalent of busking. <laughs> uh, man, oh, man. Uh, yeah, tough times. Tough times out there for Elon Levy. I don't know. It'd be fun to invite him and just see him kind of ignore our DMs. Well, sure. Let's do it. Let, let's do it. But uh, I guarantee he won't. It do might it. be I mean, like punching down too much at this point. Yeah. 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 We haven't had much success in getting people to come on and we could debate. Do and like that, him and, and, and Michael the, Rappaport. Well, exactly. Yeah. 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 But that spans the spectrum. Like we don't have many takers when we try to actually engage in discussions uh, across the spectrum. Um, you know. But uh, yeah, we can try. What about having him, Michael Rappaport, and Sarah Ashton Cirillo on like a power panel? That sounds horrible. That sounds absolutely horrible. <laughs> Is Sarah still Sarah? Because I, I think so. They changed, they changed their look. Uh, okay. Well, you know, yeah, I haven't. I think uh, it's, uh, Sarah is still the name. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of freaks. I mean, you look at the freak show that we've just like, these are the spokespeople for the rules based order. I mean, once you get past the suits, you know, the Tony Blinkens and, and, and so on, then you got Masi Alina Jad uh, looking like, you know, she's, she's like, she's, she's like from some washed up eighties hair band. Then you got John Fetterman, looking like Jimbo from the Simpsons. He looks like, you know, one of those kids who would like hang out at the parking lot behind seven 11 in your town. And then you got Elon Levy. I mean, these and, and Rappaport, I mean, he's still out there. Like he's like one of the few celebrities who's still shilling for Israel. Um, Noah, Noah Tishby's looking a little bit like, like, like she's had it as well. She was like the one model they could get. So it, yeah, it's just, I mean, you can, you can really see, although the celebrity silence continues to infuriate me, Palestine never did become the current thing like Ukraine uh, yeah. the, or Darfur, Darfur, anything. Yeah. 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 But, but no, no celebrity, the very few celebrities are willing to get up and say like, yeah, we, uh, Israel has the right to industrially slaughter children. I mean, it's just not, 
really it's done. Yeah. It's over. It's Israel for, 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 for now until as long as it lasts as a state is going to be a pariah, a source of shame, something that will have to be that the, that the U S will have to kind of drag along and we, the U S taxpayer will continue to have to pay for iron dome replenishments for as long as Israel exists. And the, it's, 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 it's expensive. And, and yeah, we, we paid for the R and D for that as well. I mean, Raytheon covered at least 50% of the bill of developing it with corporate welfare, with public money. It wasn't even a real, it's not really an Israeli technology. Anyway, um, we should move on. Yeah. Uh, Israel's, you know, we, we, we've been hearing a lot about the, the distraction from that, that, that there's this talking point that Iran has distracted from what's happening in Gaza. And Anya made a really good point that it's all part of the same war. Uh, and whatever they distracted from was not actually succeeding in ending the war. What is succeeding in rolling back the Israeli presence in Gaza is armed deterrence. That's a major factor in it. And so just one day before Iran's counterattack, these were some of the headlines that we were seeing in the Wall Street Journal and Haaretz. Um, and this is, you know, a tweet that I wrote earlier. Israel's 98th division is withdrawn from Khan Yunis in southeastern Gaza which was the largest offensive front of the Israeli military at the time. Refugees are returning in large numbers to northern Gaza right now as we speak. Bakeries are finally reopening there. Israel destroyed 70 to 80% of all bakeries. None were functioning. Hamas still stands. Hamas is fully in control in southern Gaza. And hostages have not been freed. Israel's failed to achieve that objective of freeing the hostages through military action. Now Haaretz and the Wall Street Journal assess that Israel has lost in Gaza a total defeat or is on the brink of defeat. This is a headline from Haim Levinson, who is a Haaretz columnist who has been cheering on the genocide since October 7. Um, you know, he may be at a publication, the only major Israeli publication that's willing to criticize the occupation from a kind of left liberal perspective. Saying what can't be said, Israel has been defeated, a total defeat. That's Haim Levinson at Haaretz. The war's aims won't be achieved. The hostages won't be returned through military pressure. Security won't be restored. And Israel's international ostracism won't end. We've lost, truth be told. The inability to admit it encapsulates everything you need to know about Israel's individual and mass psychology. There's a clear, sharp, predictable reality that we should begin to fathom, to process, to understand, and to draw conclusions from for the future. It's no fun to admit that we've lost. So we lie to ourselves. This is, this is, I mean, yes, it's someone from the left edge of the Zionist spectrum, but this is a very significant columnist in Israel. Then this is the wall street journal front page. Um, uh, I think two days ago, Israel wins battles, but risks war loss. Strategic Gaza goals still unmet, unmet despite tactical ground gains. Netanyahu criticized, and then this is the continuation of that article. Israel faces potential loss in war. Um, I don't think the Wall Street Journal feels comfortable proclaiming defeat, um, but it, it's starting to look like what I actually thought would happen, um, which is sort sort of like the second invasion of Lebanon, although maybe with less military losses. For Israel, when Israel just sort of left in 2006 and achieved no objectives, uh, failed to dislodge Hezbollah. And, you know, we can see right now Hezbollah has been for six months south of the, the Litani River and has basically depopulated northern Israel um, all the way past the city or town of Kiryat Shimona. So when, it, when do they get to go back? When do people get to go back to the south? Israel said that it was going to create this buffer zone in the north, but people are going back there. Hamas is not going away. They were, they achieved all these, they call them tactical victories now. That's their, their spin in the Israeli military. But uh, tactical victories are fleeting. 
if there's no operational hold uh, and Israel doesn't seem to be able to occupy Gaza on, in, on a long-term basis. So this was before Iran's attack. And now I think the strategic calculus is even has changed even further out away from Israel's favor there. I don't know if you have any thoughts, Aaron. Well, just, I mean, it's a little, I mean, it's, it's a grim thought, but the one objective I think they can achieve if they haven't already is to make Gaza or at least a large part of it unlivable. Yeah. They've destroyed everything. And uh, I do think that was one of their goals. It's pretty obvious. I mean, under what are other circumstances would you destroy all these hospitals, schools, mosques, every single university flattened? They're trying to make it unlivable. And I, I do think at least in some parts of Gaza, if not all of it, I, I think they will achieve that goal. I mean, already, even before the genocide, the UN was warning that Gaza might not be livable within the next decade because the blockade was so cruel. The attacks on Gaza's infrastructure were so uh, consistent and so devastating. And so that's the one thing I think Israel will be able to achieve. Yeah, I mean, they've set back Gaza at least 20 years. And it was already the last time I went there with Anya in 2018. You could already see that the damage to the infrastructure of the previous assaults on Gaza and the siege in general, which pre prevented the civilian authorities in Gaza from being able to bring it, bring in things as basic as sewage pipes had already made life there practically unbearable, which is what inspired October 7th. So what Israel may have done is prevented another October 7th style attack in the near future. Uh, what their, their whole, the whole purpose of their Dahia doctrine is to terrorize the civilian population to the point where they're so demoralized that they would never support something like October 7th. But I think that has failed psychologically and politically. I don't think, I think the population has so little to lose at this point that, that why would they oppose a long-term insurgency, especially if Israel's maintaining a military presence there to some degree? Um, yeah. So what we're looking at could be actually an insurgency and um, continued Israeli bombardments and then occasional attempts to achieve what they call tactical victories, like what they just did around Al-Shifa Hospital, which was a massacre, uh, throughout the rest of the year. And in the course of maintaining, you know, keeping this war going for the rest of the year, they screw Biden over, um, which isn't to say that Trump is a guaranteed uh, is, is guaranteed to do whatever Israel wants. I mean, his own interviews and talking points, he's wavered and it's unclear where Trump stands on this, but I think a Trump administration might be a little bit easier to control. Uh, and, uh, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, popular will of Palestinians, correct me if I'm wrong, but polls after October 7th showed that in the West Bank, Hamas attracted more support. Right, which yes. makes sense. Which makes sense if you know they're the one group that's resisting the occupier after decades of uh, Palestinians running out of options. They tried nonviolence. That's what the first Intifada largely was. Um, they've tried nonviolence over the years, also in, in the West Bank, um, long after the first Intifada and before it. And of course, the Great March of Return in Gaza, and, and starting in March 2018, that was met with brutal Israeli violence. So if you're out of options to resist nonviolently and then Hamas finally launches this operation against the occupier, it makes sense that support would increase. And, um, you know, uh, so the idea that Israel has in its head that by just destroying Gaza, it can crush the Palestinian will to resist. It just, there's no evidence to support that. And if you talk to any Palestinian, at least most Palestinians, I just don't think you'll find much success in that strategy by Israel. Yeah, I mean, this is a March, a poll from this March showing support has held strong since the last poll I saw in December, which showed that support for Hamas surged like 30% uh, after the October 7th attacks. And this is just, it just stems from the, de the desire of Palestinians for some political faction to do something concrete to relieve them from occupation and exile. 
Uh, and the fact that these numbers have held firm, it really speaks to the Palestinian concept or the ethos of sumud, of steadfastness, um, that you know, the longer they hold firm, hold their ground and demonstrate resilience against a colonial entity, the more likely they are to achieve liberation. And that's what we've been seeing in the Gaza Strip. Um, I think it's something that's constantly underestimated not only by Israel, but by its Western patrons. Um, they just constantly think that they can break the Palestinian spirit. And there is a class of Palestinians in like the NGOs that yearns for a more Western lifestyle. And honestly, I can't blame them. Um, and they you know, despise Hamas and blame them for October 7th and getting Gaza City destroyed. Um, and, you know, I kind of, I can kind of understand it. I mean, I live in the West. I'm a product of it. I enjoy all these luxuries and privileges, but, uh, for the majority of Palestinians who have nowhere to go, this is, you know, just holding fast, yeah. baking bread, staying in their homes, going back home to Northern Gaza is an act of resistance. And you can see it just today. Um, here's Palestinians attempting to go home to northern Gaza. Prevent them from going back. Uh, and you don't see them scattering, they're continuing. And Israel understands that once they go back to northern Gaza and get back to their homes, Israel has failed to create this kind of depopulated buffer zone. Um, it's a bad, it, it, I mean, honestly, that's a bad scene for Israel. So too is this, what's taking place in Northern Gaza, where uh, we're seeing the first bakeries actually come back into existence. So Palestinians in the north in northern Gaza who had stayed behind had been forced to eat animal feed. And so and these bakeries weren't allowed to operate under Israeli orders, right? They were basically shuttered under threat. I mean Israel bombed many bakeries, but those that it didn't bomb were basically told not to operate. Yeah, and now Kogat, which is the civilian sort of bureaucratic siege authority of Israel, is allowing the World Food Program to bring in flour, which is allowing these bakeries to operate. Uh, and we're not seeing, you know, it's, I, I think the two things are related. Nothing happens on CNN related to Gaza or foreign policy without State Department approval uh, or U.S. intelligence or Pentagon approval. CNN has now conducted an investigation showing that Israel indeed deliberately massacred Palestinians seeking to obtain flour in northern Gaza at the notorious flour massacre. Uh, the Biden administration is putting pressure on Israel to allow aid in. It's the only way they can really uh, justify preventing a ceasefire. That was their strategy all along. Give Israel bombs with one hand and give them bread give Palestinians bread with the other. So now Palestinians are getting the bread, but it is doing serious damage to Israel's objectives because the objective clearly after October 7th was to thin out the Palestinian population, push them south and create a humanitarian disaster that would force them into Egypt. And that's being reversed now, uh, thanks to all of these political factors, but also military factors and not just Iran. It's the fact that Israel's 98th division was taking heavy, ca not heavy casualties, but substantial casualties in Khan Yunus at the hands of local militias like the Al-Qassam brigades, the Al-Quds, uh, Soraya Al-Quds of Palestinian Islamic Jihad, all these different factions using locally made weapons were making it very difficult for them to maintain this endless presence. And the Israeli military, we haven't seen them in our lifetimes be involved in a war, maybe since the... Um, you know, they got in, they began to occupy Lebanon in the 1980s for six months. They're not built for depth. They're not built for a long-term war. Uh, they are filled with reservists who need to go back home to their families. Their economy has been battered. There's these, these, these guys who are reservists who run small businesses have been losing their businesses. They're basically living off state welfare. 
So they had to bring them out. And then psychologically, they were not prepared for this war and they need to be brought out to go, uh, you know, infest countries in Latin America or go to Goa and go to some rave and do a bunch of drugs so they can, you know, process whatever they just lived through and then come back uh, to the genocide brigades. So that's, so that has contributed also to this sense of defeat. It's up to the U S ultimately. It's up to the U S ultimately to pull the plug and we're just not seeing it from Biden. He's not ready to pull the plug yet, but at some point it's becoming clear that that will have to happen. Israel and Israel will have suffered defeat while having destroyed Gaza. And that will be the only victory they can point to is just human destruction without achieving political goals. Meanwhile, uh, this scene happened at a recent Trump rally. It's worth playing, I think. Uh, yeah. Trump supporters chanting Genocide Joe. One of the leading drivers of Biden's inflation disaster is his war on American energy, and Pennsylvania energy is our big problem. He said they're not wrong. Yeah, so Trump says they're not wrong, you know. Uh, not as if you can expect anything different from Trump, but still, um, at least he knows. Although, you know, at this point, honestly, you couldn't get worse than Biden, I don't think. And uh, Trump has said something about the need for the violence to end, although he also said Israel should finish the job. So, I mean, it's fair to expect, it's fair to expect he'd have the exact same policy. But um, maybe at least there'd be more Democratic pushback if he were in office doing it rather than uh, Biden doing it. Yeah, I don't know how that came about. Has there been any reporting on that or like who they were? I don't know. I, not that I've seen. I mean, it was clever. I actually saw a video further back in the crowd and there were large, like, like masses of people were chanting Genocide Joe. Hmm. So hmm. I don't know if it signals opposition to uh, the assault on Gaza. There has been this faction on the right, you know, they... They kind of revolve around Nick Fuentes. They're called the Gripers. And they've been kind of trying to force a split within the right on support for Israel. And Nick Fuentes, I mean, he's an anti-Semite. He's the dude who is like accompanying Kanye to the Alex Jones interview where Kanye was like wearing a bag over his head and praising Hitler. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't like Jews too much. Uh, but they've been forcing this contradiction out within the America first faction heck heck heckling Charlie Kirk and others whose careers have been sponsored by pro-Israel billionaires and forcing them to address during Q and a sessions, for example, the USS Liberty attack. And the fact that it's just a fact that U S support for Israel does not advance America first or American national interest. That's never been more clear, especially with Iran's response. And, you know, they've been going, it, that it's, it's gone beyond the gripers. There is a giant split among right-wing influencers within America First over the whole issue of ironclad U.S. support for Israel. And it's becoming clear who on the right is sponsored by the Israel lobby to create this kind of artificial astroturf pro-Israel consensus within the right. I mean, it all predates the Groypers too. It goes back to like the conflict between Pat Buchanan and the neocons, the paleocons and the neocons, the American conservative magazine versus National Review, uh, Ron Paul versus Mitt Romney during the Republican debates. This is a longstanding dispute, but I think it's never been more clear now that America First is sort of the dominant faction within the GOP base that Israel and the Israel lobby are an impediment to achieving the kind of American sovereignty that America first preaches. So it's made life a lot harder for people like Ben Shapiro and the Daily Wire. And here's Ben Shapiro's um, kind of loyal stooge, kind of like his Shabbos Goy, uh, Matt Walsh, who you know has taken a break from fixating on transsexuals to attack 
Palestine solidarity protesters. In the past week, we've seen Palestine protesters chanting death to America, threatening to murder public officials and now blocking traffic. These people are anti-American scumbags and anyone who's truly America first should treat them with the contempt they deserve. And, you know, just he's pumping out tweet after tweet, demanding that America first condemn uh, Palestine solidarity protesters. And basically, this is a cheap trick because, yeah, there are a lot of like freaks and misfits involved in any dissident movement in the U.S. and just pointing to them and the fact that they are woke is like a trick that right wingers use to deflect from the reality or to deflect from the contradictions of it within America first for supporting Israel to deflect from that contradiction that ironclad support for Israel contradicts American interests. So that's what he's doing on behalf of Ben Shapiro. And it speaks to the frustration that he feels uh, as more and more on the right turn away from this. And I responded just, you know, Nobody believes the Daily Wire or the Israeli Wire. And just a reminder that Netanyahu declared that the 9-11 attacks were good for Israel. He actually said this in a speech at Bar Ilan University, which was reported by the Israeli publication Ma'ariv. Um, and it was clear at the time when Ariel Sharon whispered in George W. Bush's ear, Arafat is our bin Laden. <laughs> God. Israel really enjoyed and w Israel wanted the U S to become overextended after nine 11. And that just shows how fanatic Israel is because Ar Arafat was in fact, uh, uh, Israel's collaborator. He was willing to well, sell out. Well, he was, he was, I mean, he, he signed the Oslo accords. I mean, he was a collaborator. I mean, now near the end of his life, it's true. He, he kind of, uh, grew a little bit of a spine and he rejected the Camp David farce. So fair enough. I mean, he didn't, he wasn't a complete, I shouldn't say he was a total collaborator, but he did collaborate before that. But uh, Israel was so determined to steal all the Palestinian land that it wanted. Um, that even when Arafat was willing to, uh, you know, just accept 22% of Palestine, to, which was a big compromise for Palestinians, Sharon and Ehud Barak couldn't accept that. I, I, I don't, I don't want to get into it, but, I wouldn't call Arafat a collaborator. I mean, he's someone who put Palestine on the map, uh, risked his life resisting Israel and was not a loyal enough collaborator when he assumed the role of Palestinian Authority chairman, resulting in his likely assassination. He also seemed to outsource uh, armed attacks and resistance on against Israeli Israeli soldiers involved in uh, enforcing the occupation during the Second Intifada to Marwan Barghouti, which is why Barghouti is in prison, um, who was the leader of the Tanzim faction at the time. So I just I, I don't feel comfortable calling him a collaborator like I would call I would refer a boss. To okay, a boss. I, fair enough. Fair enough. That's fair. Yeah, uh, definitely. He's not comparable to a boss in that way. Fair enough. Um. But uh, what were we talking about? <laughs> um, America first. Uh, yeah, I mean, Netanyahu uh, capitalizing on 9-11. You know. Well, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just so clear. If anyone wants to take the concept of America first seriously, it's not, I, I don't espouse America first. Those people come from a very different philosophical and political point of view than, than, than me. But if they do, they will really want to interrogate the logic of America first and also those who inspired it. I mean, you really have to go to Buchananism. Then it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work to be giving $4 billion a year and endless diplomatic support to Israel. It just doesn't make sense. And it exposes who is basically being paid and astroturfed by the Israel lobby to create this fake conservative front movement. It's really like Ben Shapiro. And these people are not, they're, they're just not going to last, especially in this era. And then we can also see just the hypocrisy of the cancel, the cancellations, the firing of all these university professors. Danny Shaw was fired at CUNY. Um, Jody Dean just got fired. Yeah. Right wingers are just going to say, oh yeah, you Marxist, uh, CTE, 
whatever they can use whatever insult they want for those people even if they're right it just doesn't add up if you're a free speech warrior and you oppose cancel culture you are basically supporting the greatest threat to free speech in the United States which is the Israel lobby and you are and you are under the influence of an ideology which represents terminal idea uh, identity politics in zionism i mean zionism is the most toxic form of identity politics on the planet it's basically identity politics enforced through violent demographic engineering <laughs> Candace Owens being canceled, the 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 obvious uh, attempt to cancel Tucker Carlson within Trump world over his interview with Muntar Isaac, the pastor from Bethlehem. I mean, all of this really highlights the hypocrisy of all of these right wingers. And yeah, facts don't care about your feelings. What Muntar Isaac was doing on Tucker was spitting pure facts about the reality of Palestinian Christians and the discriminatory logic of Zionism and Ben Shapiro's feelings just keep getting hurt by the facts. So his whole motto is a joke. Yeah, and, it's and not I'm just, here for it. I'm here for it. It's not just happening in the US. It's also happening uh, in Germany. Uh, they just try to have a Palestine Congress and the German government shut it down. Uh, intervening, they, they cut the electricity to um, uh, a building where it was being held they shut down a live stream they denied speakers trying to come into the country who were going to speak at it including a doctor who was uh working in gaza um uh who tried to fly into germany to speak and they wouldn't let him in gassan abu sita um so this is happening this is this is the value that israel is exporting to the its western allies just outright suppression of dissidents uh Dr. Abusita said, invited to address a conference in Berlin about my work in Gaza hospitals. The German government has forcibly prevented me from entering the country, silencing a witness to genocide before the ICJ adds to Germany's complicity in the ongoing massacre. That was just an unbelievable story, but shouldn't be surprising in this era. Well, this is Germany's raison d'etat, is to recognize and, and honor the its role, leading role in the Holocaust. Okay, fair enough. But it's tried to do that by getting off easy. There's a right kind of Jew and a wrong kind of Jew in Germany. And we're seeing the wrong kind of Jews wearing like kippahs at protests against the assault in Gaza, anti-Zionist Jews be brutally beaten by German cops and arrested. We're seeing witnesses to the ongoing German-backed Holocaust, who actually went there and saved lives like the heroes, the righteous Gentiles who saved the lives of Jews during the Holocaust during World War II, they're being banned from Germany, like Hassan Abu Sitta. I would assume Holocaust survivors, survivors of the Gaza Holocaust, if they wanted to speak about what they're doing, what, what they have been going through in Gaza would be banned from Germany as well. And Yanis Varoufakis, former German economic advisor, I'm mean, sorry, German, Greek advisor to the Greek government is facing some kind of criminal prosecution now in Germany. That conference was shut down ahead of his speech and the Berlin municipality has declared that his speech was anti-Semitic hate against Jews and the promotion of Islamism, and that those are banned in Germany. This is like a liberal municipal government. Um, well, Germany is where also they tried to ban a Roger Waters concert a few years ago. Yeah, the Frankfurt municipality did yeah, uh, sought yeah. to do that. So uh, it's kind of a Fourth Reich, <laughs> uh, hiding behind a veneer of liberalism, but advancing a genocide in which Germany is supplying 47% of all armaments and weapons to Israel. It's the second leading arms importer, exporter to Israel behind the US. It's providing as much diplomatic support as possible for Israel, while it's also arming you, literal Nazis in the Ukraine proxy war, who are throwing up Sig Heil salutes from the back of leopard German tanks and it's doing so behind the guise of democracy and transatlanticism and defending 
the liberal international order. It's hauling away anti-genocide activists in the dark of night. It has banned the organization Sami Dun, which is a solidarity organization with Palestinian prisoners who are languishing in dungeons and occupation prisoners. It's raided their offices. It's raided the homes of Sami Dun activists. And we can see them now trying to ban all expressions of solidarity with people who are suffering a contemporary Holocaust. Germany, whatever it is, it has lost its raison d'etat. It's completely lost it. Uh, this is no longer about honoring the victims, the Jewish victims of the Holocaust, because it is, Germany is claiming thousands and thousands of new victims every day in the Gaza Strip, and it's shutting down anyone who wants to speak about it. And we know what this is about. We know why they have diverted their solidarity with Jewish victims of the Holocaust into support for an apartheid state. It's because Germany wants to use this and the Ukraine proxy war as a way for it to rearm and for it to wait and for a means of restoring its imperial glory. Because as the U.S. steps away from the Ukraine proxy war, Germany will still be there arming them and taking on the main role of fighting Russia at the price of destroying the German economy, destroying the German working class and destroying German industry. It's, 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 in, it's just national insanity. It's contagious when you're an ally with, uh, of Israel's national insanity. Um, I'm going to jump, <laughs> I'm gonna have to jump off. Yeah. So, yeah. We've uh, been going for a while. Let's wrap it up. Thanks everybody for tuning in. This was another, uh, big audience and we really appreciate it. Please like the stream. Support the gray zone at the links you can see there below on the screen. And uh, yeah, Max, anything you want to say before we go? Well, someone's saying, someone tell Max it's raison d'etre. Well, that could also be true, but they actually say raison um, d'etat, the reason for our state to exist. The reason for our state, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that uh, means to be. Uh, state, yes. anyway. Well, you're more That's of your a French lesson. You're, French, you're Canadian, yeah. so you speak yes. more French than I do, but I think yeah. I got it right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, on that note, just before we go, we have a new interview Wyatt Reed and I conducted with Carlos Arguello, who is the lead prosecutor, a lawyer for the Nicaraguan government at the ICJ in its case against Germany. Hmm. Um, wow. And it's a fascinating interview. Uh, Carlos Arguello also led the Nicaraguan case against the United States in 1986 uh, at the ICJ over the U.S.'s illegal dirty war in Nicaragua, um, which led to a substantial judgment against the U.S., which the U.S. has never paid. So uh, check that out. It just went live on our YouTube channel, and the full transcript is on our site at thegrayzone.com. Uh, like this stream, subscribe, support any way you see fit. And uh, thanks for joining us, Aaron. Thanks again to Anya for being a part of this. And we'll see you all next week. Peace. Peace, everybody.